Um, if you're new, my name is Adam, um, and what I'd like to do before I get into the message, um, and I, I do this every once in a while, but uh, uh, Jessalyn started us off with a psalm, Psalm 88, which was a dark psalm. Um, and the truth is, some of you can relate to that right now. Uh, and if not right now, you have been in that place of darkness, just feeling despair, feeling uh, like God is absent. Uh, and for whatever reason, sometimes it's just seasons we go through. Sometimes it's because of what's going on in our lives relationally, um, health, conflict, financially, whatever it is, it really doesn't matter. But what I'd like to do is if you have anything going on in your life that is just causing you grief, and you would love to see God show up and give you wisdom, give you endurance, give you um, peace in the midst of whatever you're going through, I'd like you to stand and I'd like to pray for you. So you don't have to share what it is, obviously, but if you would stand, I'd just like to have a, a moment of prayer for those of you who are going through some. Awesome. Um, and let, let's do this. If someone near you is standing, would you stand with them and put a hand on their shoulder? And in fact, maybe one of you would just voluntarily pray out loud. Um, and I'm just going to let that go for a few seconds, and then I'm going to close in prayer. So just maybe one of you standing around someone with your hand on their shoulder, just pray, out, pray for them. Pray that they would receive from God whatever it is they need. Heavenly Father, you know exactly what's going on in our lives. Um, you know the struggle, the pain, the fears, the worries, whatever it may be, health issues. God, we just are inviting and asking your presence to be known in a very tangible way for these folks standing up here this morning. Meet them right where they're at. God, if it's comfort, give them comfort. If it's hope, give them hope. If it's repentance, let them out of the goodness and kindness of your heart, repent. But God, show yourself strong in each person's life this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being willing to do that. Um, I know that can be awkward and uncomfortable sometimes on a Sunday morning, but uh, all the more reason for me to nag you that you need to be in a small group, you need to be in a Bible study, you need to be in some kind of context where two or three or four or uh, several of you meet on a regular basis, you're studying the scriptures together, you're praying for one another, encouraging one another. It's a group of people that know you and who are there for you to support you uh, in your time of need. We all need that. And it just can't happen on a Sunday morning. It's not practical, but uh, I hope that you will, and I will continue to nag you, um, I hope you will find that and make steps towards making that happen in your life. Um, so today we're going to wrap up our kind of series within a series. We're doing a series called Coexist, um, and today we're going to hit the final part on the scriptures, the Bible. So if you have a Bible, open up to Hebrews chapter 1, one of my favorite books of the New Testament. It's towards the end of the Bible. If you don't have a Bible with you, there's one under the, uh, on a seat nearby, hopefully. And if you don't have a Bible, I have a gift for you. Come on up and see me afterwards, and I will give you a free Bible. Um, I had a conversation, a couple conversations in the last 10 days or so, uh, met a guy who was a believer and we were chatting and talking and he was feeling me out, where do I stand on certain theological subjects? Um, and, and in the course of the conversation, I asked him, so where do you go to church? And he says, well, I don't really go to church. I have a little church that meets in my home. There's three of us. One of them's on Zoom. Um, and he threw out the, the, the common verse that people throw out, and, and it's in Matthew 18, where it says, where two or three are gathered. Um, maybe one of the most misquoted, misunderstood scriptures in the New Testament. It's not talking about church um, per se. 
Uh, but anyway, I didn't want to get in an argument discussion. I just met the guy. Uh, but then uh, a few days ago, I had another conversation with someone um, who wants me to do their wedding. And I love doing weddings. I love to spend time premarital counseling and, and, and helping people. Preventative is so much better than uh, repair. Uh, and, and so, but I had to say, which I hate to do, I said, okay, I'd love to do your wedding, but you've got to move out. And it led into another discussion and a long discussion. And we, we have a relationship. We have a rapport with one another. And so we can kind of speak the truth. And, um, uh, uh, but he conveyed exactly what we've been talking about the last few weeks. And that is, is that people, uh, very common modern argument against the Bible is that the Bible is archaic. It's outdated. It needs to be updated to reflect current culture. Times have changed. Um, and by the way, the Bible promotes a lot of things like patriarchy, slavery, anti-science. Um, and we can take some stuff out of the Bible, but we also need to upload new information. And what I found is in these conversations I have with people, the, the new information that people want to have when it comes to the Bible comes in three areas. Number one, our time and how we spend our time. Um, do we Sabbath rest? Do we even know what that means in America? Uh, and secondly, our money. And thirdly, our sex lives. Well, the book of Hebrews speaks to this idea of uploading new information or um, making the Bible more current with modern culture. And so I want to read for you Hebrews chapter 1, just the first few verses. We're going to start there, and they're going to ha have you look at another verse in chapter 4. But let's, let's start in chapter 1, right at the very beginning. This is how it opens up. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, and that's important there, these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. That's something to contemplate and think about. Jesus was there. And it was through him that the universe was made. The sun is the radiance of God's glory. I wish we could do a whole sermon on that. We, we probably will in a few weeks when we talk about Jesus. Uh, and the exact representation of his being, that is God's being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And after he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. God, help us to understand what you're saying to us uh, in these passages of Scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. So first week I talked about how the Scriptures are reliable. Then I talked about how we need to come under the authority of the Scriptures. Today I want to talk about how Jesus brings God's final word. The Scriptures we have are enough. They're enough for everything we need to know to live a godly life and be pleasing to God. And when you think about it, we have a God who speaks. Uh, we don't worship a force. It's not an it. It's not some impersonal, uh, supernatural force that's out there. We have an intimate, personal God who speaks to us. Now, nature can be wonderful. I, you know, you, you see a sunset. For example, here's a picture of a sunset on what my wife calls Miller Ridge. This is our backyard. This is what we get to look out at. And often there's deer and turkey uh, filling up that backyard. And, and while sunsets are beautiful and they can move us, or one of my favorite places, Yosemite, we can move, be moved emotionally at the, the greatness of God and the, the beauty of God through nature. But no matter how beautiful nature is, it cannot replace friendship. It cannot replace, for example, the intimacy of marriage. As beautiful as they are, they cannot replace a personal, intimate God. And so God has not only given us his word, he's given us his final word. He has spoken. And, and he says that he has spoken in many ways and, and, and many times and in various ways, which in Greek is a play on words. And essentially what the author is saying he, in the past, he has spoken in part, in piecemeal. But in Jesus, 
in Jesus, God has given his final word and then sat down, which is a metaphor for it is finished after providing purification for sins, which is the cross. In other words, it's complete. It's final. The life and teachings of Jesus, witnessed and recorded by the apostles, is the final revelation of God. And because salvation is complete, that is the purification from sins, so too is revelation complete. Which means the Bible doesn't need to be updated, it cannot be improved upon, it cannot be corrected, and it can't be added to. Because... How can you improve upon Jesus? But, you might argue, don't Christians pick and choose arbitrarily what they follow and what they don't follow? What about slavery? What about the patriarchy? All kinds of questions. And they're great questions. And by the way, if you're new here, this is a safe place to ask questions. No question is too simple. No question is too hostile if you have an honest heart to seek for the truth. But let me address a few of these issues um, before we get more into the message. Let me talk about the, the idea that Christians arbitrarily pick and choose what laws to follow. While I will agree that there are some Christians that do that, primarily what that argument is addressing is, well, what about, you know, you're supposed to wear your hair a certain way in the Old Testament and don't get tattooed. And uh, there's all kinds of Old Testament, especially we talked about this last week. There's all kinds of ceremonial, sacrificial laws that when Jesus died and rose again from the dead, it says he put an end to that. The dietary laws, he put an end to that. All those laws that surrounded the temple and, and worship and sacrificial system, he put an end to that. And so Jesus' sacrifice provided what was needed. All of that Old Testament ceremony was a shadow of what was to come. It all pointed to the reality of who Jesus was. He is the fulfillment of the law. And so while the Bible tells us, and this is key, the Bible would tell us what laws to follow and what laws not to follow of the Old Testament. We don't just arbitrarily decide. The Bible tells us which ones to follow. Um, and primarily the laws, if you read the New Testament and you're familiar with the Old Testament, primarily the laws that we are asked to continue to follow are moral laws. It was wrong to envy in the Old Testament. It's still wrong. It was wrong to commit adultery in the Old Testament. It's still wrong. It was wrong to um, commit murder in the Old Testament. It's still wrong. And so we don't just arbitrarily, we look to the Bible to help us understand what is to be followed. Well, what about slavery? Doesn't the Bible condone slavery? And I remind you of my favorite term from C.S. Lewis, we need to avoid chronological snobbery. That is looking at ancient cultures and projecting our current sensibilities of what's right and what's good and what's pleasing on that culture. We have to read the Old Testament in light of its, current, of its culture at that time, as well as the surrounding cultures of the people of Israel. See, God takes the world as it is, not as we would like it to be. He takes it as it is, and he works in such a way to accomplish his plan of redemption without compromising our ability or their ability to choose. So, my first question would be, if someone wanted to make this argument about slavery, I would say, well, what is slavery? What do you mean by slavery? Are you talking about, and most likely they are, they're talking about the race-based uh, African slave trade. But what's interesting is both the Old Testament in Deuteronomy and the New Testament in 1 Timothy, both testaments condemn the trading of slaves. Did you know that? And we need to understand what slavery meant in ancient cultures. It didn't mean what it means to many of us today. In fact, if you want to look at it more closely, it might be called a form of bankruptcy law. See, slavery primarily in ancient culture was a way for someone to work off their debt to the person that they owed. 
I bet some of you have felt like a slave to your job. But there were all kinds of checks and balances. When God gave the law, he gave all kinds of checks and balances surrounding this idea of servitude uh, and slavery. For example, did you know that you could not make someone work more than six years? You had to set them free even if their debt was not fully paid off after six years. In fact, if you abused a servant, you would have to send, uh, set that servant free. You could not abuse them and beat them up. Also, if a slave ran away from his master and came to you, you were told by the Old Testament law, don't send him back. Which is essentially saying, and this is mind-blowing and astounding, considering the context of the ancient culture, you are to give the benefit of the doubt to the slave, not the master. And there's so much more surrounding this that we don't have time to get into, but, but to say that the Bible condones slavery is misleading at best. And bear in mind, more current culture, both in Great Britain and in the U.S. It was Christians who used the scriptures, the Bible, as their authority to argue and defend that slaves should be set free. And they helped move culture away from slavery. And as a side note, slavery still exists today. In fact, The best statistical data that we have says there's more slaves now than there ever has been at one time on the earth. They estimate at least 50 million. Um, And that has a lot to do with the sex trade. It also has a lot to do with indentured servanthood where people wanting to get out of debt sell themselves and the interest rate is so high they never have a chance to get out of debt and it becomes generational servitude. What about the patriarchy? Doesn't the Bible condone patriarchy? Again, I would ask the question, well, what do you mean? By the way, when someone comes to you with an argument from the scriptures, they want to argue Christianity, great question. What do you mean? Tell me what you mean. And and, in my argument, I don't want to even call it an argument, my discussion with someone, if they were going to bring up the, the idea of patriarchy, I would say, well, well, what was God's original intent? We have to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 before sin entered the world. See, when sin entered the world, it was like an atomic bomb blew up and the fall of that atomic explosion continues to this day. Before sin, everything was different. Before sin, we see what God originally intended. But when sin entered the equation, it has led to a might makes right where women were even considered property in ancient times. So considering the context of ancient cultures and the way women were viewed and abused, considering that, the Bible, even the Old Testament, elevates the status of women in astounding ways. For example, go back to the beginning, Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Women were created in the image of God just like men. Both Adam and Eve were created in the image of God. Daughters, by the Levitical law, could at times inherit land, which was unbelievable and unheard of. Laws about adultery. In other cultures and in other times, it was only the woman that was punished, but the Levitical law says, no, the man needs to be punished as well. And then there were laws protecting widows and women in many other ways. And so historically, culturally, the Bible, even the Old Testament, was extremely progressive and far more humane. And the real clue as to how God feels about women, we look to the New Testament. How did Jesus treat women? Did you know it was unheard of for a rabbi to allow a woman to sit at his feet and receive teaching? And yet Jesus did that. In fact, there were many women who followed Jesus. They weren't titled apostles, but they were disciples. And many of the women, it says, provided for Jesus financially and those knucklehead men who never seemed to get it right. Women in the early church held prominent roles. They were prophets and prophetesses. In fact, Paul talks about women who were co-laborers with him. 
And so in the case of women's rights, even in America, it was Christians who led the charge under the authority of the scriptures. They used the scriptures as their their evidence as to why, and their argument as to why women should have certain freedoms, like being able to vote, equal pay, all of that. Uh, Let me give you some examples of some women in early American history. Some of you, most of you have heard of Susan B. Anthony. She was a Quaker, strong Christian, who campaigned vigorously for the rights of women to vote. Harriet Beecher Stowe, who was a Christian abolitionist, and so she fought not only against the slave trade, but also for women's rights. And she is famous for writing Uncle Tom's Cabin. And then my favorite out of these three that I'm going to share. I love this name, Sojourner Truth. Is that not a name? I wish I knew about her before I named my daughter. Uh, She probably wouldn't appreciate it, though. Um, But she was born into slavery, later became a Christian evangelist, and she became an abolitionist as well as an advocate for women's rights. And And one of her most famous speeches was titled, Ain't I a Woman? And then I found this quote, uh, doing some research on her, and I love this. Christ came from God and a woman. Man had nothing to do with him. I love it. And it's true. And it was the men who abandoned him in his hour of greatest need. It was the women who were there at the cross. And so while there are difficulties in the scriptures, for sure, And there are parts that we will find offensive to our modern sensibilities. By and large, the original readers had no problem with the things that we struggle with today. And so the Bible is complete. It's complete because, A, revelation is done. But B, because salvation has been accomplished through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Now, here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying God can't speak in other ways to us. So let me address that. Flip over to chapter 4 in the book of Hebrews and go down to verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. And my second point is this. The Bible is alive. It is not a dead book. It is a living document that speaks clearly and loudly to us today. Listen to what this author says through the Spirit. For the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. Ooh, this is the scary part. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. You're not going to slip anything past God. See, it's only because the Bible is final and complete and cannot be improved upon and that his word is living and dynamic that we can hear God speak to us today. Let me give you two ways that God speaks to us today. Let me give you two ways that he pierces our heart, where the word of God, like a double-edged sword, pierces us. And the first thing it it can do is pierce uh, us with his love. It can pierce our hearts with his love. Thomas Goodwin, who was a Puritan preacher, and uh, I love looking up these pictures of these old dudes, and I think these Puritans, you know, they they get a... Uh, they don't get a, an easy going. People look back. In fact, the idea of Puritan is almost a, uh, a diss these days. But these guys were secret hippies. Look at that hair. Um, they'd have fit right in the 70s, man. <laughs> but he was commenting on a verse in Romans, and, and he obs- as he was uh, out walking, and he observed a father and his young son, and they were walking next to each other. And at one point, the father picked up his son and hugged him and looked him in the face and said, I love you. And the son hugged him back and said, I love you too. And he thought to himself, is the boy more loved by his father when he's walking next to him on the sidewalk than he is when he's being hugged and saying, I love you? 
I shared this story before, but in a very dark moment, the earthquake of 89, I was at work. And I ended up riding my bike home in the dark all the way to downtown San Jose where I lived in the dorm in college. And I crawled up in bed with tears in my eyes going through a very deep personal uh, grief. And I didn't know what to say to God. And I just pictured myself crawling up in his lap and just letting him hold me. He didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. But I felt his presence. Some of you have never had a moment like that. Some of you can't conceive of a moment like that. Some of you have had that moment, but it's been a long time. But it starts with accepting that the Bible is reliable, you can trust it. It it, it starts with putting yourself under the authority of the Scriptures. And then the Bible can become immensely personal to the point where you begin to see every word as specifically for you. One of my challenges as someone who teaches and has been to Bible college is that I I, I try to understand what the scriptures are saying to ancient people. I try to understand what the scriptures want to say to you, and sometimes I forget. i got to remember the scriptures need to speak to me too. And so we're told that the scriptures penetrate. We're told that the scriptures are a power We're told that through the word that his power can begin to operate in and through our lives. And sometimes this happens immediately. We read part of God's word and it jumps off the page and it's for us and we own it. And we're like, thank you, God, for speaking to us. But sometimes it happens slowly over time. But God's word can pierce us with his love. But it can also pierce us with his light. And when the scriptures refer to God as light, he's talking about how God brings light. There is no sin. There's no darkness in him. And it also is an allusion to his holiness and his righteousness. God's word sometimes has bad news for me and for us. Sometimes God's word shows us things about ourselves that are uncomfortable. Especially when God lets us see our true motives at times. We think we have good motives. We think we're doing it because we want to please God, but maybe not completely. George Whitfield, who was a contemporary of uh, uh, the founders of our country, when his wife gave birth to his only child, he named him John after John the Baptist, and he told a crowd one day that God told him, he had a word from God, And that word from God was that his son would one day grow up and be a great preacher. A few months later, his son got a fever and died. And in the depths of his grief, he realized what he had done. What he had done was essentially what you and I have done too, is he's taken a very natural feeling in his heart where he wants the best for his child. And he deified it. Or in his words, he baptized it. And he confused a very natural inclination of his heart and his emotions and his love for his child with the voice of God. Now, I'm not saying that God can't speak to you sometimes through your inclinations, through your emotions, through promptings. But a wise and mature believer will always be a little suspect. And and here's what we need to know, too. Sometimes God removes feelings. He wants us to know effectively the sense of his presence, but he also doesn't want us to become addicted to our emotions. And sometimes he will remove the sense of his presence, not because he's mad at us or disappointed in us, because he doesn't want us to become addicted to our emotions. And sometimes God leads us to a desert to make us thirsty. And I also say that God will never speak to you through your emotions in a way that contradicts his revealed living word. I remember when I became aware and it took a deep, dark time in darkness or desert, whatever you want to call it, where I realized I was using ministry to feel good about myself, to prop myself up and feel like I'm worthy, like I'm good. 
And I needed two things. I needed his love, but I also needed his light. I needed truth. I didn't need new revelation. I needed my heart to be open to what had already been revealed through his word. And we need friends like this. Every friendship, every relationship that you've had that has been helpful to you is because they've had the power to confront you and at times tell you the truth. And, and wouldn't you rather hear the truth from someone that loves you? See, if we only accept the parts we like, we risk missing out on all the great things that God wants to give us. So we have to accept all of it, even the parts that we're uncomfortable with, even the parts that we don't like. See, I can never understand his love and his grace and his mercy and how amazing it is if I don't first see that I am a sinner in need of it. And we don't want to believe that we are as bad or as selfish as the Bible says we are at times. But until we can accept that, until we can allow that to happen, we will never be able to accept what the Bible says about how loved we are and how cherished we are by God. And so this last part, I, I just want to give you some examples. I completely changed my message last night. I said, this is heavy. This is hard. Uh, you don't need another punch in the gut from me. And so I want to give you some examples, mostly from my own life, um, where God's word has come alive in my heart. And I feel a lot like the blind man in Mark chapter 8. In Mark chapter 8, Jesus heals a blind man, and he comes up to him and he spits in his eyes and kind of rubs him. Kind of an awkward moment, I'm sure. Um, but he couldn't see fully. Wasn't completely healed. He says, I, I see like trees. Those are people, I think, but they look like trees. And so Jesus prayed again over him, and then his eyes were finally opened. In other words, some of these realities that God wants to teach us, it, Sometimes it happens instantly, praise God when it does, but it doesn't always happen that way. For me, knowing God's love, I got little doses over the years, especially understanding that God's love came from a loving Heavenly Father. And it was after 20 years, and I won't get into the story, I've shared it before, but, but it, there was a moment where finally my heart opened up, my eyes saw, and I sensed God's love in a way I'd never had before. Partly because my love was based on my ability to perform. If I performed, I got loved. But I woke up one morning, before I could perform, before I could read my Bible or pray or do anything godly, I felt loved, just as I was. Uh, one of my Achilles heels, if you will, one of, my, one of the, the, the instruments that Satan often has used in my life is condemnation. And I remember reading 1 John 3.20, where it says, if our hearts condemn us, yes, it does all the time, God, we know that God is greater than our hearts. Whew. I was like, wow, that's for me. John may have been writing to Christians in the first century, but God spoke to me right now in that verse. Just last year this happened. One of the first verses I memorized 38 years ago was Proverbs 1.7. The beginning of the wisdom is what? The fear of the Lord. And God kind of opened my eyes to a whole new understanding of what it means to fear God. I can remember as a young Christian feeling abandoned my, by my parents. Kicking me out of the house had something to do with that. <laughs> and I remember reading Psalm 2710, Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Wow. When I was in college, I bought a 67 Volkswagen Bug <laughs> for 750 bucks. Emptied my savings account. About a week later, it caught on fire. I got a note from my pastor's wife, and she was just offering encouragement. But then she included a verse, which I had never heard before, Jeremiah 29, 11. We sang it earlier. It says this, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Man, the encouragement that filled, flooded my heart reading that passage at that time. 
It's so important. My first mission trip in the Philippines, I was memorizing verses about the forgiveness of God and about sin and righteousness, and I became deeply aware of my sinfulness for the very first time as a Christian. And it came reading 1 John chapter 1. In verse 8, it says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But then I found great encouragement with the next verse. But if we confess our sins, that is, if we admit He is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And then Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. I misunderstood this parable. Jesus tells a little parable in the midst of several other parables. And it goes like this. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, he went and sold all that he had and bought the field. And see, my original understanding of this was, okay, I'm the farmer. I'm going to buy this field so I can get this treasure. But if I want this treasure and the treasure is Christ, then I need to sell everything and I need to give up everything. I don't know if I can do that. That's pressure. How do I know I'm doing that? And then I understood I was reading that parable wrong. God isn't the treasure. I'm the treasure, and he's the farmer. He's the one that sold everything, who gave up everything so that he could have the treasure, and you're that treasure too. My first mission trip to the Philippines was through an organization called OC International, which was started by Dick and Margaret Hillis. They were missionaries in China back in the 1940s before World War II, where they got kicked out. Um... And they also started an organization called Sports Ambassadors. I'm like, the Bible and sports? Are you kidding me? This is too good to be true. Got to go to the Philippines and play basketball and teach the Bible. Um, but they tell a story in their book where they were uh, in China. They were caught up during the Japanese invasion. They lived with their two children in inland in an inland town called Shenkyu. And the village was tense with fear. And every day brought terrifying reports of the Japanese advance. And the worst, at the worst possible time, Dick Hillis developed appendicitis. And he knew that his life depended upon making the long journey by rickshaw to a hospital. And so on January 15th, 1941, with deep foreboding, Margaret watched him leave. Soon the Chinese colonel came with news. The enemy was near and townspeople must evacuate. And Margaret shivered. She knew that her one-year-old Johnny and her two-month-old Margaret Anne would never survive as refugees. And so she stayed put. Early the next morning, she tore off the page from a wall calendar and read the new day's scripture. It was Psalm 56.3. It said this, When I am afraid, I will put my trust in you. And then the town emptied during the day, and the next morning... She rose, feeling abandoned. The town was empty. The new verse on the calendar was Psalm 910. Those who, know your na- those who know your name trust in you, for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. And she felt the presence of God. The next morning, she rose to distant sounds of gunfire and worried about food for her children. But the calendar verse was Genesis 50:21. I will nourish you and your little ones. An old woodman suddenly came to their house with a pail of steaming goat's milk, and a short time later, a straggler arrived with a basket of eggs. Throughout the day, sounds of warfare grew louder and louder, and during the night, Margaret prayed for deliverance. The next morning, she tore the page from the calendar to read Psalm 56, 9. My enemies will turn back, and I will call for help. By this, I will know that God is for me. The battle was looming closer, and Margaret didn't go to bed that night. The invasion seemed imminent, but the next morning, all was quiet, and suddenly, villagers began to return and trickle into their homes, and the colonel knocked on her door late that morning. For some reason, he told her, the Japanese had withdrawn their troops. No one could understand it, but the danger had passed, and they were secure. 
Now I will tell you, Margaret and Dick Hillis didn't live by just a verse on a calendar wall. They lived in God's word. In times of darkness and in times of plenty, they trusted the scriptures. Did you know there are more than 7,000 promises in scriptures for you and for me? And so you see, the Bible can pierce our hearts. It can pierce our hearts with love. It can pierce our hearts with light. But it's never to hurt us. It's always to help us. And with that in mind, our Lord and Savior, Jesus, was pierced. Not metaphorically. He was pierced with nails in his hands and his feet. And he was pierced in his side with a spear. And Isaiah prophesied thousand years before Christ, he was pierced for our transgressions. See, he was pierced unto death so that you and I might be pierced with his love and with his light unto life. And you see, when this becomes intensely personal, when you go from God died for the sins of the world to Jesus died for me, when that takes place in your life, that's when you begin to get a grip on your anger, on your fears, on your anxiety, on your struggles. That's when real transformation begins to take place in your life. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word and the way in which over some 38 years you have used it to pierce my heart with love and with light. And God, I can even remember times where it seems that you withdrew yourself from me. I felt the absence of your presence, but it made me thirsty, made me hungry. And so God, wherever we're at on our journey with you, maybe we've never cracked the Bible, maybe we've been reading the Bible for decades. God, let your word come alive in our hearts and our minds. As we, as we lift it up as your final word, as your authority in our lives, and as we put our trust in the reliability of what you've given us. God, we know you can speak in many ways, in various ways. But God, it seems you have chosen your word primarily to guide us and to speak to us. And so use it. Help us, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. When you're ready, please come on up and grab the elements for communion. And maybe as you take it today, you'll just thank God that he was pierced for our sins. Mm -hmm.